Welcome to the World Evangelism Podcast. I'm your host, Austin Gardner. I'm excited to be with you. As you know, I have been trying to share with you a little bit about mentorship, and there's a whole lot more I want to share. But as of yet, I've not taken you so much into the biblical aspect, and today I want to dive into more of the biblical aspect of mentoring. It's the basis that I've used to build all of my ministry. And if you're watching online right now on YouTube, you are noticing that I have here with me our oldest son, Chris. And Chris is a pastor and a financial advisor. He can explain that just a little bit better to you. And if you don't know him, I am proud to introduce you to him. And so he has been involved mentoring for many, many years. And so I thought it would be wonderful to have his input. I get it almost everything I do anyway. And so, Chris, why don't you just say a word about who you are and what you do, and uh, then we will start into it. Yep. So my name's Chris Gardner. Glad to be with you guys today. Absolutely love talking about mentoring. I don't believe there's many things in the world that matters more than that, um, that people reproduce themselves and others. And so excited to talk about that today. I work as a financial planner, a wealth strategist, and a philanthropic strategist. I help people. What, what is a philanthropic strategist? A philanthropic strategist is you get to a point with your wealth to where you are no longer wondering whether you have enough. The question now is what do we do and what dent do we make in the world now? And so I actually help people go through that, talk about their strategy, how they can impact the world with the gospel of Jesus Christ from the, 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 what God has given them financially. So that's what I do and uh, funnest job in the world and can't wait to see you. Uh, can't wait to see uh, what happens today talking about mentoring and talking about, um, uh, you know, how God can use us in that in that way. I think that many people may consider mentoring to be a business topic or a secular topic. And the more biblical way of referring it to it would probably be discipleship training. Uh, uh, and I think maybe even a better way to describe it would be leadership training. We train leaders. And that's the ministry we learned from Jesus. That's what he did. He came to the earth and he picked 12 men. He had no backup plan. And if you read uh, Coleman's book, The Master Plan of Evangelism, you'd be thrilled to read the story. And there's another great book for you to get a hold of called uh, uh, Ministering for Mission. By Mentoring for Mission. Mentoring for Mission. What did I say? Ministering. Mentoring for Mission. And uh, that is by Gunter Carlman tremendous book there are many books written on the subject but the apostle paul described it best when he said and the things that thou hast heard of me which you've heard me teach among many witnesses you heard me while we were in church you heard me when we were in, con in public you heard me when we were in a congregation you heard me when we were soul winning when we were discipling you heard me say it i want you to commit that to faithful men who are able to teach others also so every man and every woman ought to be taking what they've heard and what they've been taught from the Word of God that the Holy Spirit of God has reinforced in them. They ought to find someone else they can teach and train. But for the average missionary or pastor, that means preparing somebody else to do the ministry. I always like to think of it this way. If you don't have a successor, you are not a success. If you can't train someone else to do what you're doing, you have failed. And so that's really uh, where I want to take it today. Uh, Chris, jump in here and give us a couple ideas. Yeah, so, you know, I'd say we said it more, sounds more like a business idea or it sounds more like a leadership idea. And the truth of the matter is that biblical concepts apply to every single aspect of who we are because uh, that, that, that's if you want success in business, you have to do the same thing. If you want success in your family, you have to do the same thing. So it's a God it's a God principle that applies to every single place where a human heartbeat impacts it. And so that's, you know, our, we have to understand that our job is to reproduce ourselves and others. The story of the Bible is not the story 
of uh, it's not the story of a bunch of disjointed people. It's the story of people who impacted other people. And there's a line of people who have been impacted and learned and grown. And so, you know, it's a human topic. And you, if you're listening today as a businessman, you need to listen to this. This is vital for what you're going to do. This is vital for a missionary. It's vital for a pastor. Mentoring, training others is of the utmost importance in absolutely every single thing that we do. I think you understand that if you don't reproduce yourself, it ends with you. And, you know, that's the key in a family, isn't it? You know, when uh, you're a, a kid and then you get married and uh, it's just you and your wife. And uh, honestly, that's where it'll end if you don't have children. And then God gives you children and then your children grow up and they have children. And you realize that you made a difference because you were able to parent some children that were able to parent some children that will make a difference. And so that's exactly what we do in the ministry. And that's exactly what we do in business. Now, I'm just going to kind of walk you through it. And Chris will be back, back and forth and giving other uh, points of view. But, you know, that is the ministry program you see in the life of Jesus. Yeah. It's what I call the life on life discipleship. It is that your life impacts another life, that you share your life so that they learn what you model, not so much what you teach. It's not about what you say. It's about what you do. It's actually not about what you do. It's about who you are. And you reproduce what you are more than you do about what you say or do. And in the Bible, what's interesting is Jesus is, uh, ordains 12 that they will be with him. He ordains 12 to be with him that he might send him forth to preach. And uh, then as you go through the scriptures, they are with him. When he's alone, he says, I'm alone, but they're with him. And you'll find that in the scriptures. And then when they become great and successful men, the world took note of the fact that they had been with Jesus. So his life so impacted them that it made a world-changing difference, and that's what got things going. Yeah, you know, you, one of the things that you always said when I was growing up and in college is uh, it's caught, not taught. And there's a list of, you know, at least six things that are caught, not taught. Your values are caught. They're not taught. You can say whatever you want from the pulpit. You can say whatever you want from your classroom. You can, you know, you can have your public persona that always portrays this. But values are caught. They're not taught. The second thing, character, is caught not taught. And so, by the way, if you don't do life on life discipleship, if, you, if you're not sharing your life, nothing can be caught. It can be taught. By the way, YouTube can teach. By the way, you know, TikTok can teach. These, we have so much material at our fingertips. When I was growing up, pastors almost had this idea that they could control the material that somebody got. They're like, I'll give you the next lesson once you finish this one. And like you're the purveyor of all good material and you'll give them a little bit and you'll feed them little by, little by little. But we're not in that day and age anymore. Not even close to it. The material's out there. But you have to understand, life on life discipleship matters even more when everything's out there. Because values are caught, they're not taught. Character is caught, is not taught. Attitudes are caught, is not taught. Lifestyle is caught, is not taught. Your passion is caught, not taught. And then the culture of who you are is caught, not taught. So just understand the importance of the fact that things that are caught and not taught are actually the things that are going to change the world. The knowledge that people are going to get from YouTube, the knowledge you're going to get from going to an online college, the knowledge that they're going to get by reading a book, that's not what's going to change the world. What changes the world is a person who has spent life on life discipleship. So they have shared their values. They have shared their character. They have shared their attitudes. They have shared their lifestyle, their passion, and their culture. And when you sweat together and when you bleed together and when those things are a part of your life, that's where everything begins to change, and that's where the impact of the world is truly possible. I hope you uh, think about that just a little bit. You know, I think that probably one of the most discouraging things for anybody who preaches is that you will spend hours and hours preparing the greatest message you've ever preached, and a week later, no one remembers it. You know, they don't remember what you say. They remember how you are. They remember the person they watch and talk and feel for. That's why, in all honesty, YouTube 
and the internet and Google and AI cannot replace what your life can do in the life of another. And so the important thing to consider is, will you share your life? Will you share your life? Because it's the sharing of your life. It's them seeing you on the good days. It's them seeing you on the bad days, when you're up and when you're down, when you're fussing with your wife and when you're mm. very much in love with your wife, when you can't pay your bills and when you got more money than you need. All of those times, they need to be around you to learn to be who you are and what you are. Yeah, I, you know, that's, I don't know how to say it any, any better than that. And so make sure, make sure that you understand the, you know, the value of life on life. I would ask you at the end of every week that you need to sit down and go, how much time did I, did I spend preparing to preach? How much time did I spend preaching? How much time did I spend teaching? How much time did I spend going through a book? How much time did I spend? And then ask yourself, how much time did I spend doing life on life discipleship. It has to be prioritized. The number one priority in your life is not what you say from behind the pulpit. It's not what you say from an open book. It's not what you say. Prioritizing life on life discipleship is that's where you emulate Jesus's model of knowing and understanding the importance of others. It's Mark three fourteen that he called these men so that he could be with them. He's spent a concentrated amount of time with a few individuals, went deep with them, and allowed them to watch his life, to see his life from a distance, close up, medium, medium separation from him. Everywhere they went, they were able to see it because Jesus prioritized life on life discipleship. And the idea was passed down so much that when Paul comes up, he says to Timothy the exact same thing. And, and talk about a man that was prioritizing life on life discipleship. When they put Paul in, 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 in prison, as he's sitting there in prison, he's attached to somebody. They're, they're sitting there and the jailer is there with him. Somebody's there next to him. And as he's doing that, he's like, hey, they don't understand. They just put me in the ideal position I could be in. My job's to be or prioritizing life on life discipleship. So you're going to chain me to my next disciple? That sounds great to me. Let's go for it. Let's do it again. For a matter of fact, if you'd like, when we're done with him, send the next one in. I'll do this all day, every day, because this was the priority of his life. It was life on life discipleship. And to prioritize that takes us out of our comfort zone. We live in a day and age, the American dream. You pull yourself up by your own bootstraps. You are your own man. You want to be independently wealthy. You want to own your own business. And it's all about isolation when true impact in the world only happens when we truly prioritize life on life discipleship. I think this is an extremely important uh, aspect for you to learn as you talk about mentoring. And, and that is that you would share your life. Now, consider this with me. Uh, how many times, how many great sermons of Jesus do we have in the Bible? Well, we have Matthew 13. That's a great teaching. We have the Sermon on the Mount. But what we have more is Jesus being with his disciples. We have Jesus healing, but what do we have more? Hmm. Jesus being with his disciples. We have Jesus feeding the hungry. But what do we have more? Jesus being with his disciples. If there was ever anyone who knew how to train people, it was Jesus. And he could have easily set up a Bible college, but he didn't. Because it's not about the lessons. It's about the person giving the lessons. It's about learning how those lessons really worked in a person's life. I often try to remind missionaries when they're starting out that starting a Bible college isn't near as effective as mentoring and spending time, training one-on-one. -on -one. And if it had been a better way, I think Jesus would have thought of it. I think Jesus would have thought of it. Now, do you want to say anything about that yeah. before I sw swap gears here? Absolutely. One, one of the things that I would say is this. If, if you are spending the majority of your time preaching and teaching and opening a book or sending stuff and sharing, and sharing your wealth of knowledge, you cannot disciple a man. Because discipleship demands life on life. Um, I, I have four children. And man, I have some children that if you were around them, you would think 
They don't have any character flaws. They have no problems. Man, these are the sharpest kids ever. But I'm their dad. I've had life on life experience with them. And you know what that means? That means that I can truly help them. You cannot help somebody until you know their life, not their knowledge. That doesn't come with a grade. It's not an A, B, C, D, F. It's not a 89, 89 points. That's not what you can do to truly help someone grow. The only way for you to impact the world is through life on life discipleship. But truly the only way to help somebody grow is when you understand who they are, where they are, what their weaknesses are. When you watch them and you see them and you've been with them, then you understand where they're at and you can use that to truly help them grow. So life on life discipleship is important for impacting the world. But honestly, discipleship outside of life on life is truly not possible. So make sure you know your people, you spent time and you can help them grow. I think it's interesting. I was on a coaching call earlier today with a young man I'm helping in the ministry. And, uh, uh, you know, he has made the comment that I don't say anything new that he hasn't already heard. I think that's a very normal response. And then he said, but it's so much better. He said, I've hmm. heard you teach it. I've heard others teach it in mass. He said, but when somebody's sitting here looking at me and going, how's that working in your life? How does that help you? How can I help you implement that? He said he, he anticipates the call every week. We meet one hour a week, every week, and we go over everything that's going on in his ministry, and he is excited. God has already uh, given him over a 10% increase in attendance. One of the other guys saw a 50% increase in attendance in one week, and they knew the truths. See, it's yeah. not about knowledge it's about putting it into practice. It's not about how much, uh, how many lessons I've had, but it's a, it, it's a, it's also about motivation and uh, encouragement and love and help and acceptance, and it just makes a tremendous difference. And so that's what mentoring is. It is life on life. Yeah, it's loving accountability. That's the key. It's literally saying I'm going to hold you accountable in love. And by the way. I'm not going to stand behind a, a podium, a pulpit. I'm not going to stand behind a place where I can yell at you. I'm going to get down with you in the trenches, and I'm going to model transparency. I'm going to model vulnerability. I'm not going to tell you this is the answer. I want to tell you, let me, let me show you seven ways that I tried to do this and failed. So you're not just sitting there from the pulpit saying to them or from behind the lectern explaining to them how you have achieved this great position that you're in. Instead of that, you're sitting there with your arm wrapped around them and saying, man, I remember when I did that. I remember when I felt at that. Man, nobody's felt at that more than I have. When they hear that and then they say, okay, so you, didn't, you weren't always great at it. When you're able to model transparency, you're able to model vulnerability. That is when it truly impacts other people. And you know, I've watched for years, you, you've been, always been very transparent, um, very vulnerable, just opening up your, your, your heart, opening up who you are. Honestly, you, there's not a life and then the life that's separate, that's different than what you do in public. It's all about everything I am, giving it to those people. I've watched that in you and I've watched that train other men and help people. And I would tell you that it's vital for us as well. Model transparency, model vulnerability, exercise patience, exercise understanding, be, hold them accountable, involve them in ministry, be a part, be there with them. And then I would say one of the most important things is this, always set high expectations for them. Always set high expectations for them. You, know, you expect them to do well. You expect them to do well so that when they do well, it changes everything. You're, you're, you're sitting there talking to them saying, hey, I expect you to do well. The problem is you get, you, you, you get what you expect. And if you don't expect them to do well, like, hey, I'm better than you are. You'll never do as well as I do. It's going to show in the results because you were not there with them helping them in that part of their lives. I think that one of the things I would like to drive home, which has been said to you already today over and over and over in this discussion, is this. If being behind a pulpit and writing books and uh, making podcasts 
and uh, preparing materials was the answer, I think Jesus would have done that. But he didn't write a book. Now, I know the Holy Spirit of God wrote the Bible, no, so don't get me wrong there. But in Jesus' earthly ministry, he trained 12 men. He principally chained Peter, James, and John, who shared much of that teaching with the other guys. And I just want you to understand, maybe beyond anything else, it's not the pulpit ministry. It's not the pen ministry. It is you sharing your life. What if they prayed with you and heard you agonize and heard you not know what to say? What if they studied with you and saw that you got stumped? What if they went soul winning with you and saw what it was like when you led people to Christ or when they would reject you? What if they went counseling with you? What if they made hospital visits with you? What if they were there when you were agonizing over how you were going to pay the bills or not? You see, the more they're with you and the more they share your life, the more that's going to impact them because they're learning how to live. And I'll just say this before Chris gives a, another take on this, but, you know, you, your children don't remember the lesson on how to tie a shoe. Mm. Your children don't remember the lesson on how to use a fork. Your children don't remember the lesson on how to button a shirt. But they learned them all, didn't they? Mm -hmm. And it was them working with you. Chris? So I, I would, let's, let's finish by asking you a question. Where do you start? So there's somebody that's sitting there. They've never heard of doing this. By the way, the funny thing is we're talking to you from a medium that does not have the potential to be life on life. We understand that, but hopefully it will get you closer to understanding how you can be life on life. By the way, if you know anything about us, reach out. We would love to be in your life and to help you even more where you're at right now. Um, you, you, let's get on the phone. I'll travel to where you're at. My dad will. Let's spend time talking and explaining and, and, and going through it. And let's, let's struggle through things together. But where does a guy go? He's a pastor. He's been pastoring. He's, man, he's a great preacher. He knows how to study. And man, he's got all this down. What should he do? What would the first step for that be? I remember you used to teach lessons on this that I thought were phenomenal. So walk a guy through what does he do first and how does he find the right person to begin mentoring? Let me say that there is one way. You can answer the podcast. There's actually a chat where you can send me a message about what you thought of the podcast, especially if you're using Spotify or Apple and, uh, or Buzzsprout. You can do that, and I would love to get an email from you or whatever. I'll just say this. You know, it first starts with you deciding to find in people uh, or see in people what God has in them and not where they are now. And so you're going to have to look at the people on your, you're going to have to look at the people around you and you have to say to yourself, I see them where they're going to be and not where they are. Hmm. I see them where they're going to be and not where they are. So you don't always find them at a Christian college. Uh, I would say you don't necessarily find them at a Christian college. I'd say the guy in your church that may look like the biggest weirdo may end up being the guy. I would say that the person hurting the most may be the guy. And then I would say to you that uh, you, the second thing you have to do is you have to decide, I'm going to love them. Now, this isn't an emotion you feel. It's an action you take. And so what you're going to do is you're going to say, I'm going to love them. I'm going to help them. I'm going to be there for them. And I'm going to be making a difference in their life. If they don't love me back, that's fine. If they try to hurt me, that's fine. Uh, the more I love, the less I be loved. That's what the Apostle Paul said about the people he trained. And then let me give you one more step. And then I would just say what you want to do is I call it putting a ball in their court. And so the way you get started is you give them a small piece of homework and you do it to a bunch of guys. So maybe it is memorize John three sixteen and let's talk about it. Or maybe it is uh, read this short gospel track and let's talk about it. And you ask everybody. And then a week later, you come up and you say, hey, did you read that? Did you memorize that? Let's talk. And the majority won't, but one will say, yes, I did. And now you're on the road. But you keep talking to the rest of them because they might come on the road next week. You never give up on anybody. A famous preacher I knew when I was a kid said, you don't ever give up on anybody if they've been dead four days because we know one of them that came back to life after four days. And so all I'm saying to you is put the ball in their court Ask them to go on a visitation call with you. 
Ask them to do something with you. Ask them to read something, do something, and then get together and discuss it. And that'll be a good step towards getting started. All right, Chris, what else to wind us down? So, you know, I, I would say a couple of things. Number one, if you're a pastor and you're listening to this, it might be time for you to stop praying for church growth and start praying for men that you can impact their lives with life on life discipleship. That's good. Um, it's, you know, we live in a day and age where it's all about the numbers. Hey, how many do you have? How many do you have? But I believe if we change our prayer, by the way, Jesus, when he was going to choose the 12 that dad used to teach a lesson on this, he spent time praying. So your prayer life ought to be dedicated not to just, Hey, how can I grow the church? Man, I've grew the church. Cause the problem is this, when you get a disciple, no, nobody, no magazine, no podcast, no blogs going to want to talk to you about that. Because guess what? That's not what we, what we emphasize. We emphasize, hey, they took this church over and it grew like crazy. But the truth of the matter is you might need to stop praying for church growth and start, start praying that God will allow you, he would send somebody to you that you could truly impact their lives. Maybe begin there. Lord, show me one person. And then take some, this is going to shock you, Take some time out of your study time even and spend it with, a, with, with someone and impart what you're learning with him and spend time with him and not, not a, hey, let's meet at 12 and we'll be done at 1247. No, but literally life on life. And when you do that, I believe that, that those are the steps that you take as you watch and, 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 and watch what God can do when you, when you do that correctly. I think what you've heard is liquid gold, huh? I think uh, I would say to you, instead of investing so much in church growth, invest in the personal growth of a disciple. That's a good point. I think, you, I think Chris will hit the nail on the head right there. As you help that other guy grow, the church will grow. Yep. Let, it be, uh, let it be that you didn't use your ministry. You didn't use your people to grow your ministry. Use your ministry to grow people, and then God will grow your ministry. Mm -hmm. So I challenge you to consider that. I want to thank you so much for being with us, you want to say a couple of final words or anything? Enjoyed it. Thank, for, thank you for being here. I listen to every one of these. I learn uh, from it as well, and I'm thankful to be here with you today and hope it's been a lesson to you. Well, it's been an honor to me to have our son Chris here with us, and uh, thank you for being with us on the World Evangelism Podcast. I would really appreciate it if you gave us a like or shared this and told somebody else about it and get some more people. Uh, we're really booming. I'm telling you, we got about 18 average downloads a week. But we're pushing 600 already. So God is, uh, excuse me, 400 and something. That was not right. We're pushing 400 and something. And I'm excited about what God's doing and looking forward to more. And by the way, any day now, the new book, Pain to Praise, will be released. I hope you'll be one of the first people in helping me uh, by buying a copy of it and giving it a good uh, review if you feel like it's worth it. And I thank you so much for being with us. God bless you. And we'll see you next time on the World Evangelism Podcast.